But I think the the actual travel around afterwards. I mean, I went like everyone else. I, I did a, I did a big loop. I, I took a I took a bus from to Adelaide and then took another bus on like a little tour up through the desert up to Uluru and all the way to Darwin and then crossed down from, from Cairns and dived my way through it. I, yeah, that's just some, some beautiful memories. I think even sort of just being in the outback in a swag, just looking at the stars. I mean, that's that's just something else. Yeah. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm your host, Rob Malicki, coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. I'm super pumped for today's conversation. He's an old friend, Yakvin Klein, who's the Director of Future Students at the University of Queensland, an awesome storyteller. And if you haven't already heard his episode on the Departure Lounge podcast, I'd highly recommend you go and listen to that because there are some absolutely cracking stories in there. I'm looking forward to unpacking a few more today. Yakvin, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks, Rob, and, and thanks for having me. Getting to be a serial pest on this podcast is becoming a little bit of a side job for me. I appreciate it. It really is, mate. Like you, you're becoming like one of those people that ends up on podcasts, which is which is pretty cool. But I can understand why, because having listened to quite a few of the episodes that you have been on as preparation for this conversation, mate, you're a cracking storyteller. And one of the things that, that I love when you're telling a story is you can be telling some dramatic story and you're just so calm, mate. Where, where did your unflappable calmness come from? Oh God, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I guess we, we I mean, being of uh, Icelandic heritage, we are a, a nation of storytellers. There's a rather extraordinary fact about Iceland that one in 10 Icelanders is a published author, which sounds really impressive. But of course, also, if you do the maths, there's not a lot of people and there's some really, really terrible books. I've got, I've got sort of uh, second cousins and uncles who are writing some pretty ordinary uh, books about their favorite pair of gum boots and stuff. So when did it go? I think probably we're all products of how we grow up. And one of the things that I think has been quite formative for me was that it, at quite an early stage, I was exposed to a lot of sort of international travel and actually being put in some rather precarious situations. So I think my dad had a, a fairly rough time at school in a sort of conservative school in, in the Faroe Islands. And you often talked about that with less than fond tones. I think they used to get, you know, smacked with keys and things like that. His real aspiration for me was to, he's going to put me in the complete opposite. So he put me into this school that can only be described as so. It's called free. In Denmark, we have these free schools. So they are really private schools, but they, many of them are operated on the fringes of society and, and they're certainly not religious in any way. And this is one that I ended up in. It's a sort of, tell you, described as a sort of, hippie a product of the hippie ages in, in Denmark so founded in the 60s really um, a lot of focus on music a lot of focus on global society and uh, peace love and happiness and and one of the things that they that, that sort of manifested in was pretty loose approach to curriculum and quality control I think so Views were optional and attendance certainly was or was not monitored particularly well. It was a tiny school. There's only about 130 kids in, in total in school. A lot of music. But when we were about 11 or 12, every year they would send us overseas on some sort of experience. And I guess that this is where, where I guess you, you and I have a little bit of an overlap and are bonded over that. They would send us to, I mean, first, first we went canoeing in Sweden, which, you know, again, just sounds fairly safe, but just the way that we do Everyone had to bring their own dagger. We would just sort of use that to throw at each other. We would have sort of adults who were less than sober the whole time. It was just, just sort of madness. And uh, and every year, so follow, we would sort of be sent to faraway countries. More and more outrageous places. <laughs> more and more, yeah. I mean, it was all in Europe, so it wasn't like for us. The, the, the sort of subsequent generations, I think they took it pretty far and ended up sending them to, to pretty, pretty actually dangerous places. But like, I remember... It's probably about 14, 14 or 15 when they sent us. Like we had to, we went on this trip to Spain for a month and we had to live with these tuna, tuna fishers in, in the south, in, in Andalusia. But the way that we did it was we actually rebuilt a 1963 Mercedes bus as a school project. I remember when we were 14. We had to sort of build this bus. Let's just say there wasn't a seat belt inside and turned half of it into sort of futons and beds and, and then we drove from Denmark to the south of Spain 
which is a pretty long distance. And in this rattly old bus, that I think one of the issues was that we had we couldn't make the minimum speed limit on the autobahn, so we had to go some back ways. And we, all we had to fix it was so gaffer tape, and it you know, kept breaking down. And, and sort of throughout, of course, because it was we were actually quite good. I mean, uh, my sort of personal rebellion to all of this hippie nonsense was not to do drugs and end up in business school. But the on the way, we would we would busk like out. I've been about 14 years old busking, playing samba outside of the Kölner dorm, making, you know, a, a bit of uh, Deutschmark as it was back then. And of course, the teachers did the only sensible thing when you make a couple of hundred Deutschmark, we should just go straight up and buy a whole bunch of beer. And then allow these 14 year old kids in this rally old bus, no seat belts, all beds. Let's just all get drunk on the way. So, I mean, it was remarkable. And maybe some of the unflappability uh, came from, from being exposed to a lot of those kinds of situations. I think, I mean, I've spoken about, you know, I got stabbed in the leg in Portugal as well on a similar kind of venture. EU is sponsored, by the way. Yeah, so lots of sort of crazy experiences like that early on probably. Helped. It's funny you're saying, you know, your form of rebellion was to not do drugs and go go to business school. And it makes me wonder... What about the other kids that you went to school with? Have you stayed in touch with any of them? Do you know where any of them have ended up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm all part of... Probably like new counsellors or something now, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Some of them, so, I mean, most of them have done quite well. And I think it's quite... It's like um, We talked about it the other day. I mean, because in Denmark, I mean, because you go, you're together from, from K to 9, so you have a lot of time to get... And there was only 12, of, uh, 12 14 of us, I think, in my class. So we were really tight. I'm very close with with my my friends still and that's actually one of the reasons that people that move to denmark find it really difficult to make friends because every, everyone in denmark has had all the friends they've known since they were six you're not penetrating that particularly easily i think yeah no though i don't do well some of them became professional musicians and, and uh, do really well the photographers a lot of them work in in sort of the arts i think a lot of them sort of went on to do really well despite the fact um of, of the career i think there was absolutely flaws though i mean one of the one of the i mean it wasn't a particularly well resourced school, so but a, a lot of people would see it as a sort of hail mary. So you get some kids that had done not done well, or probably today would have been diagnosed with ADHD or, or some sort of spectrum disorder. And they would end there, and it was there was no safety net really for them. So I think that was a bit tough. But of the ones who sort of made it through, a lot of them had gone on to do really well. And I mean, randomly uh, through this, I mean, I, I'm not particularly mu- musical at all, but most of my friends in Denmark are are really very good musicians and, and many of them are quite famous in Denmark. Do you reckon, and maybe this is impossible to answer, but do you reckon people are happier if they've gone through that sort of more open, flexible background? So the reason I have, we've, we've, our kids are at school here here in Australia doing great. And we've also, we've kind of got those alternative schools here, here in Sydney. So I've often wondered like, okay, you've, you've got more flexibility obviously inside that system to go and explore your interests and yeah, build a Mercedes bus. I mean, fan- fantastic, right? What's the kind of long-term, you know, payback on that? Or is, is there one? Yeah, I think there is. I think that I mean, gives you some level of, I mean, if you get through it, because I, I mean, I was one of the, normally quite good at good in school anyways. And I think that's, so, so if you make it through that system, I think you, you can benefit. I've just seen, I mean, there, there are some pretty, I had a, there's a guy who was, he was a year below me who he he struggled a fair bit, and he was, he, I think he was about 13 or 14 when they realized he was extremely nearsighted. He just basically, for all of his school, hadn't seen anything. And it was a very difficult time. So, so I think it, it is, in some ways, a little bit brutal, those, those things. I mean, if, if you can adapt, if you, if, you, if you do well in that system, I think there's a whole bunch of things that, that you get and take from that. That have been really good for me. I think some of the downside as well is to being sort of given complete freedom. I've often wondered whether or not I'm just I've never just never really had to then apply myself particularly hard or, or it was I was never really sort of encouraged to work hard. I don't remember getting any homework at all until I was about seventeen, which was a which was a real shock. And I think sort of like now they've sort of did the research shows that that's actually potentially quite a good thing in young formative years. But that was doesn't bite the side I was just sort of just running around sort of forever ending up and eating your tetanus shots renewed because you stepped on rusty nails in unsafe areas I think you can do really well I think if you are academically properly minded and so it sort of went I think it was, it was bifurcated a little bit the, 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 the kids I went to school with who did well ended up 
being able to go to uni have done really well and a lot of the world become doctors and PhDs and, and do really amazing things but the others ended up pay, playing bass in a reggae band which is probably a happy life as well it probably is a happy life as well <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah very happy and so when you when you you finish school you go to uni yeah. and at some point you decide you're going to go and do an exchange program how did you yeah. get signing on, on Australia why Oz I actually, I was a very much a maturist. So I there was four years between when I finished high school to when I went to uni. So I maybe a, some people know, but, but I have a, a whole previous career in office furniture. Okay, we have to. And no pun intended. We need to unpack that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for a Swedish, not not that Swedish company, but another Swedish company. So I worked four years in office furniture, and I was doing really well. Actually, I was you know I was just started. My then girlfriend's mom worked for this company and got me a job and a, and a sort of summer job in the warehouse after I finished. And I just picked it up really. I mean, warehouse work, but but the admins. It was sort of the admin was a little bit shoddy, and and even as a sort of eighteen year old, I, I did uh, I picked it up quite quick. And actually, one of the I know this is a bit enough, but the very early on, my boss at the time, who was, who was really good, he said, I need someone who can understand how to use Excel, specifically Excel. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll learn how to do that. And they sent me to this week-long one-on-one Excel course. I just sat with a guy for a whole week and learned, learned the whole thing. Well, a lot of the thing. And I became like a certified, back then they called it a mouse, Microsoft Microsoft Office user specialist in Excel. So I was really, I was very good at it quite early on. It sort of allows you to solve a lot of problems really quickly. And, and, you know, if you are working in an environment where no one has even touched it, it's sort of indistinguishable from magic. I could just sort of do math like that. So so I did really well. And so they kept promoting me in, in that company. And, and before I knew it, I was the head delivery planner for this company, looking after all of Denmark, the Faroe Islands and Greenland in delivery of this furniture. I had 20, 30 drivers that I was managing on, on the daily. And I just became really boring, Rob. I just really, my I remember my housemate, because I used to know everything about all this furniture. And whenever on TV, on the news, they would pan across any room. I would tell them, oh, that's the 6231, that one. I mean, they should have probably put that with the N32, but I don't know what they're doing. And he was like, shut up. Just shut up. Yeah, like, some you're just not supposed to know. Yeah, but... yeah, 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 exactly. And, and so I did that for a long And I mean, it was sort of really, it took me a long time, like even financially to get back to where, because I, I, I mean, I bought an apartment. It was a really nice apartment in downtown Orbos. They would, you know, the company had a private jet. I got flown to London to watch the the Chelsea play Copenhagen. I, it's a whole bunch of perks that came with this job. But I just sort of looked around going, oh gosh, I'm, 22 now it's this is this can't be my life forever and i decided i I needed to to go to university i'm like no no one on on my father's side had had gone to university before i was never pushed to neither of my parents sort of finished university yeah i was you know whatever there was an open day my my dad would sort of promise to take me but would sort of end up being too drunk to take me and so i was really not on my radar but actually, my then girlfriend, she was she went to university and she said, "No, no, this you should, you need to go to university." And so she pushed. Me. And the one one of the things I really wanted to go uh, and live overseas. Aarhus is I love Aarhus where I was living, and, and but I just thought this is I, I need to try something else. And I wanted to go to the U.S., but my the university I went to had some pretty ordinary exchange agreements in the U.S. Just for clarity, you went to Aarhus Business School, or would would you now? Yeah, yeah. You, you knew Aarhus nowadays, but. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was there when they merged. So you know, at at the time it was wow. all the school of all the school of business and it became was, yeah. Oh yeah, which is on BSS. But yeah, the all the all the agreements in the US were all sort of Shippensburg and, and sort of regional college towns which which are great, but wasn't really for me. I wanted I thought of in my head I was like, I'll go out there and I'll go to New York or I'll go to you know Chicago or somewhere cool. So when I looked at the list and actually I was really disciplined. I was extremely I know I was the only one who went to all the classes in and every lecture in year one because some of them, quite a few of them, I was the only one who showed up because they would put them Friday morning at eight o'clock. But I, I was there for everything. Extremely disciplined. So I ended up top of top of my year level and of course got first pick for exchange agreements because that, that's how that works. And they had a brand new exchange agreement with Deakin, which they said was in Melbourne, which is on the fringes of Melbourne, let's just say. So I, I just said, yeah, I'm going to Melbourne. It's really, it was a slightly tricky time, my, my family at home. And I just need to get as far away as I can. And I think, well, why not? Why not Australia? 
And Denmark is, is quite generous. So I was, I got a grant. They paid for my flights to go. I got paid like a stipend every month. And I, I got first pick. So so I chose to go to, to Deakin. What, what's your first memory of the plane in Australia? My first I, I was thinking about it the other day. We were talking about the challenges of adapting to life in Australia for people who have English as a second language or third or fourth um, language. The, my, my first one, I remember get, arriving in Melbourne and moving up, to getting through passport control, and the lady at passport control, she said, "How are you going?" I genuinely thought it was a question about how would I get to 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 the, to the next to my, my destination. And so my response was, "I believe there will be like I believe there will be a man who picked me up." And I just didn't I didn't pick. And my English is is decent, right? So I just find that you know we, we really have to look after our, our students when they arrive because I had no idea how are you going. What do you mean? So that's my first memory. Yeah. That's awesome. That's interesting. So I find like Scandinavians and Australians culturally it feels quite close, you know, like the sort of just self-depreciating sense of humor, kind of deadpan sort of sense of humor. And actually it's interesting because my wife's from overseas too, and she sort of talks about it's, it's, it's quite hard to crack friendship circles here as well. You know, it takes a long time to build those friendships. But have you found the same thing? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's just hard to make friends as an adult man. I mean, uh, or as an adult in general, I've of course moved around a fair bit, and you end up making friends often through work or through, through school. You have to be much more targeted. I mean, Mel, when I moved to Melbourne, Melbourne is full of people who have just moved to Melbourne, mainly from Perth, for for, for reasons. So, so I made all these friends who are invariably from Perth that I just, I mean, I proactively I signed myself up to play cricket, indoor indoor cricket, because I thought that looks easy. So it's, it's not as easy as it looks actually. But the so I did that. Because I, I knew I needed, needed friends. So I've actually done that a few times. Even when I went to university, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not happy with my current group of friends. I'm going to go out and see if I can get some better ones. So I signed myself up for joining the mentoring programs and things like that. What's your lasting memory, the lasting highlight from that exchange program? Oh, good question. I, mean, I did a lot of travel afterwards. So, so it wasn't really so much about the studies, but, but the, the overall experience. I made some, some quite good friends. I'm Australian, but also some you know, Americans and, and others. But I think the, the actual travel around afterwards, I, mean, I went like everyone else. I, I, did, I did a big loop. I, I, took a, I took a bus to Adelaide and then took another bus, or like a little tour up through the desert up to Uluru and all the way to Darwin and then crossed down from, from Cairns and dived my way through it. I, yeah, there's just some, some beautiful memories. I think even sort of it being in the outback in a swag looking at the stars I mean that's that's just something else you can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIEC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. Did you feel like you were going to come back? No. No? No, no. no. It, was, I was, it was my farewell loop. I thought I'll do this and this is all together too far away. And so that wasn't, that, it was never my, my plan. Um, so where did, okay, where did it go wrong then? Well, I went back and, and I, some bro- my, I had my then girlfriend was, came down and she, she worked all here and we, incredibly amicable we just decided this isn't really going to work let's do the trip and and then when we get back we'll, we'll go in separate ways so i was just i uh, sort of in, in danish in danish standards fairly fairly poor when i got back and you know i just broken up with my girlfriend my mom was in rehab my dad was nowhere to be found it was a bit of a low a low point i ended up moving into this sort of hippie commune a lot of the people I'd have gone to school with had started this commune of, of musos. I wasn't really hippie. It was just a whole bunch of musicians who lived in, in a share house. And I just remember, I went up and, and I needed to get my you know, my grades converted. I just remember handing in my, my Deakin papers because they were, of course, hard copy back then. And they had a little sign that they were looking for for, for stuff there in, in the student counseling area. And and I, I signed up for that. And one of the first, pretty early on, this, this lovely Australian girl came into my uh, office asking for some help been helping her ever since so 
the, the honorable thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually, I mean, we, became, we were really good friends for, for a long time. So she, she, she was an international student, obviously, and and I, was, for some reason, I was running a big chunk of of our open day, and I needed international students. So I got her a job there, and then I got her another job, and we, I think, we were friends for about two years, and and. And sort of things evolved from that and when I finished my my master's and, and she was finishing up as well we decided to move back to Australia together yeah would you guys ever live in Denmark together I mean you've had she's obviously had a good stint over there but would you, would yeah. you ever think of moving over there with the family yeah yeah exactly I mean there's lots of cool places to live I, I just think well, if you can move back to Europe you move to like a place that's slightly warmer and pleasant and I can come on the record as back to gosh I believe it's gotten better but even sort of I'm not sure if I could, yeah. You know, I, I probably would. I don't think that the rest of the family is, are super keen on it. I think we found our little, our little niche here in Brisbane because the, the weather is lovely and, and yeah, it's, it's a good, comfortable life here. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Because, I mean, sort of, you were at Swinburne University when you, when I first came, came to know you. Was that your, your first role in was RMIT was first, wasn't it? No, no, no. My first role in Australia was at La Trobe. Ah, okay, there we go. So my first job was at La Trobe in domestic recruitment. So because I'd done things like that job, I'd done open days. And, and so when I arrived, I thought that seems like a, something that I would probably be able to do. It was a great first job, actually. And, and the driving around country Victoria in, in a Toyota Camry and talking to kids about studying in Bendigo and Mil- Miljura and that's in Bundura. It's, of course, you need a kid from, from Denmark to go and tell you about that, but it was, it was a really good job. And actually, I, at the time, so my, my, then the, the, the boss who hired me, who has since become a, a really good close friend, was very pregnant in the interview. So she she threw up <laughs> into you. And, and I just remember calling calling back in my, my wife after that going, I don't think that went well. <laughs> at that point, when I made made the chair of the panel throw up, I, I don't think that went well. But we've so we stayed in touch with her for, for a long time and, and actually... Subsequently, she became my boss at RMIT Vietnam. So they connected, yeah. Yeah, awesome. It's fascinating, mate. Like, I hadn't realized the La Trobe connection. And this, this all sort of starts to make sense because obviously with future students at UQ, you're doing domestic and international. So it makes sense you've got, had that domestic recruitment lens. But what's fascinating is you've seen the whole, spe- it was probably one of those very few people that have really seen the whole spectrum of the sort of uni space where you've been you know, a smaller institution, one that's got lots of regional campuses. And now you're kind of up in the group of eight. You know, working for a prestige ins- institution. What's your sort of overall impression of the Australian higher education landscape? Well, that's a massive question. So I might just leave that open for you to attack however you want. That's a gosh, so yeah, that is a big one. I mean, fundamentally, there are no bad universities in Australia. I think that's, I was, because they just came out there this week, their, their rankings, and I was sort of reading through cursorily some of the data and the comments. And one that comes out is that Australia sort of ranks on average higher than than universities in, in say, the UK and, and the US and, and Canada. And I think that's, we, we don't have that sort of, that's, they're really, there are fundamentally not really bad universities in this country. They're all quite good. So of, of the ones that I've, I've worked at, I think the, you would send your kids to all of them for a variety of reasons. So I think that's probably my, my sort of primary observation is that we have really, really good universities in this country. And I mean, that's of course something uh, that I think would be important for the country to protect and it's a little bit challenging at, at the moment. Since coming to, to UQ, I mean, UQ is an ex- just a phenomenal place. I think it's when, one of my favorite things is getting to go around into our institutes and, and research areas and have a look at what they're actually, what the output is there. And some of it is just mind blowing. So looking at quantum biotechnologies that are growing, you know, they can grow neurons onto diamonds and using quantum microscopy microscopy to actually have a look at how neurons and thoughts are formed in the brain it's, it's, it's next level amazing so I, i'm enjoying that yeah. you've seen quite a few different areas of international ed of course it's fascinating to hear the story about the, about the spreadsheet being spreadsheet wizard because now your sort of experience also sort of covers this breadth right like you've got this superpower around data and i suppose analysis and things like that You've worked on the human side, you know, actually looking after the humans, advising, obviously the marketing and recruitment side of things. Where do you feel, and now, now like management, now like obviously you're managing a big team, looking across all of that. Where do you feel like you're most at home amongst that whole skill set? 
a question. That's a good question. I'm enjoying the management side of it at the moment. I think we're, we're I mean, seeing that the teams do what they do and grow in those areas. I think that's that's really fascinating. I'm really for at the moment. I'm just working with some really smart cookies that are doing really amazing. So I've that's been a joy. And I think where I, I feel like I can I can probably add a little bit of value is around connecting a whole bunch of these areas. And I think then connecting it into how what's the actual governance of a university. It can be an incredibly frustrating place to work. Things move slowly and, and they follow sort of committee structures and uh, the, the actual governance of the of the university can be can be frustrating. But once you once you sort of work it out, there, there, you can be at peace with that. And then you can sort of try to make sure that you, you bring your team along. The, the classic example is, you know, when you have, you know, because I, I look after our, our admissions area here, and when you've got, you know, you've got a student who, you know, the cutoff might be 80, but you've got someone who's coming in with a 79.97. Can't we just let them in? Well, actually, no, like, then, then the requirement would have been, been different. And it's not fair for, for you know, whoever does it to stand over some, missions person to say oh you know just be common sense so, yeah i get that but now what you can do and it's not going to help this particular case is if you think that the entry requirements should be 79 then you write up the paper and you submit it to this subcommittee that will lead into this subcommittee that will end up at academic board at some point and that's just how things necessarily have to work at a university that's as big as, as ours and i think once you sort of are at peace with with the governance of that then you can also when you can start an impact on on where you where you think you can make some changes, but the actual big blocks, you got to understand how it all works. Yeah, processes actually do empower freedom as well. It empowers that staff member to make choices because they know what the limits are, and there's a clear clear line to then escalate that somewhere else where where need be. I mean, just thinking about that, you know, it feels feels like technology is making the world move so much faster than ever before. Do you feel like a, a, the universities are, are at risk? in some way, as this kind of new industrial revolution with AI and the like, and not even just necessarily AI, just technology in general, sort of sweeps sweeps us forward? Yeah, I'm not sure if universities in particular are it's more at risk than, than the society at large. I think the capabilities of new and emerging technologies are really very profound, and we have specific challenges as it relates to how do we allow students to to use new technologies? And, and I think we we're striking a reasonably good balance. We've got some very smart people who are looking at which, sensibly, we can't ban you know the use of AI. So we want to make sure that we uh, make our students as good as possible at using it. And I mean that that's what you know, you're seeing it a lot. You know that it, it's going to be the people that are good at using AI who's going to be taking the jobs, not the AI itself. So I think it's incumbent on us to be able to to teach that to students but but even it is an interesting one when it comes to us as professionals in this area i mean where can we use it i mean i've noticed it there's certainly some of our you know partners and even some of my old staff or friends from vietnam who i used to get sort of lovely little sort of emails from and it's quite clear that they've they've discovered chat gpt or something it's like getting an email from jeffrey chaucer or some sort of middle english it's really quite, quite hard, 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 to, hard to understand what they're actually trying to say so i think that's yeah, uh, but, but I can. It, it's so powerful. And I'm the sort of person who really like technology and we share that with you. And I find it fun to play with. And I'm on all of these platforms, figuring out what it can do. And But how we then integrate it into our actual working life, I think is, is interesting. And I think it's also then, you know, giving us ourselves the, the freedom to do it. We've got a pretty incredible tech stack at, at UQ in particular, and I think most universities do. We've got Copilot here enabled, and it's sort of the, the, the standard, but it does feel like, oh, that's the cheat button. But actually, it's, it's perfectly sensible to use it in, in a whole bunch of, of, of cases. Even our, we, we, like many other universities, have the, the full Adobe stack, which is incredibly powerful just in, in creating content and creating assets but what are the boundaries and how, how are we able to use it i don't think the, the governance of that probably hasn't caught up completely in that way that you talk about it being free we haven't been free we're not free yet to to use it it's funny isn't it i mean i feel like the risk in it is more like for people like you and me and our age group and older you know those of us who are excited about it and are happy to you know tinker and learn and and move forward we'll be fine you know in fact to some extent we, we we're the ultimate beneficiaries because we've got the experience of having worked with real humans from the beginning and knowing and you know being advanced in our careers that that stuff will help us i feel the you know our kids 
our kids are just going to grow up native native in that, so they will be fine. But then it's like there's that whole other group of people, yeah, like our age and older, who if they, if they don't embrace it, you know, that, that wave moves fast. And like if you're not kind of on it really quickly, then perhaps there's some, some risk there. Yeah, I think that's true. And there's also elements of it that I think... So my son, who's nine, has gotten into writing poetry, which is really lovely. The artistic gene seems to have, have skipped a generation. But he's writing these little poems. It's all very, and, and they're very good, actually, to the point where he wrote one and then showed it to some family members who were quite going, no, no, that's just chat GPT. That's so demoralizing in a way. Like he found... It's a little spark and a little flame going there, and they've just gone, oh, yeah, you can just, chat GPT could have done that better, right? I just wonder, it's, how do you keep that sort of, that spark alive, right? Let's if you can, if you, if you, if you just get a little crushed off the bat with that. When you go like, and it's similar with languages. I had the, the sort of good fortune of catching up and, and getting to meet the, the founder of Duolingo just the other day. Oh, I saw that on LinkedIn, massive jealousy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and he's a thoroughly impressive guy and, and really passionate about, you know, what le- language learning can do and, and, you know, talking about things how people sort of, you know, they might pick up Spanish and their intent wasn't to travel to Spain or Mexico or anywhere, but now they, they've learned to like, and then they want to go and, and it's, you know, crossing borders, very idealistic. And, and it's, yeah, yeah, it was a real treat to get to meet him. But then you also go, I mean, I was in China recently and I'm not going to learn Chinese. Come on, realistically, I'm not learning Chinese. But I can get along quite fine there through the apps. I made my way from the airport into my hotel just using public transport when I was recently there just because I wanted to see if I could. And you totally can. You know, point a camera, translates everything. You know, Alipay, it's easy. You know, the, the new Samsung phones where, you know, we speak in English and it's Korean at the other end. Like that's, at some point you then... You know, the, you get to a point where the, you know the syntax and all of the things that sort of you, you worked out the maths and the algorithms, but all of the things that sort of carry carry sort of cultural meaning. And in my culture, where we would have two hundred different ways to say fog, as in as in a cloudy morning, not the other one. Is you mean that's not the same in Melbourne? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But but you know, the, the Inuits have all the different languages for snow, and 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 there's a whole bunch of things there where you just go, oh, well, if you just call it fog, it's not a fog; it's like the fog where the sun shines through. It's just a different kind of thing. I think that that's the real. I mean, how do how do we make sure that all of that continues? I mean, how do you artistic? Because you know, what did you say to your son? Keep it up, mate. I saw I saw you write that, and that's beautiful. Keep doing it; it's very cool. Yeah, it almost I think. You have to do it just for the pure love, right? Exactly. You know, if, if the poetry is in your heart, then you have you just have to write it. But yeah, because anyone can go to ChatGPT and ask for a poem now, but that's not the yeah. same thing as as like right. the the feeling, you know, the feeling of that thing. Yeah, yeah, and I, th- I think that we've seen you know, there is a bit of that backlash where you're like, you know, the, the AI is, is is doing the art, the poetry, and the painting, and and all that, so that you have more time to do your dishes and you know, cleaning you. Right. What do you reckon your dad would have made of it? And once again, like without wanting to, to dive too deep into it, just because I, you talk a lot about your dad in in the departure land episode, so I once again encourage people to go listen to it. Cause it's, it's a great listen. But what do you reckon your dad would have made of it? Oh, he would have been swearing and said it was all a bunch of Pokemon, and he would have been. Oh, actually, he was no, he was into technology as, as well. He would have. He would have probably used it to write angry letters to the, to the government or something. But I think in particular, we were. I mean, you can see if you go on to, and I've done it a bit with my kids on sort of Garage Band on the on the iPad. You know, you can. It's so easy to make sort of music that sort of sounds like music, and it's it's. He would have absolutely hated that. Absolutely hated because it's you know again it's you don't kind of need to learn how to play the drums. You just go and press press the buttons and it plays the drums in a random in a way. So no, he would have not. Last question about it, and maybe it's kind of like pulls together a couple of threads of thing, things we've been talking about. And then other thing, other podcasts I've heard you you talking, and and you talk like quite fondly about the Faroes and like the Faroe Islands, where where you know your family's from, where you're from originally. And you paint this beautiful picture. I think in in one of them you're talking about sort of climbing up a hill and smelling the grass and looking out on the islands. And just as you're sort of telling that story, I, I almost felt like these roots, like you know, there's some part of you, Yakton, which is kind of like just buried there you know but, but i suppose australia's kind of the same too now right i mean you've been here a long time the family's here what do you hope for for your kids in that sense 
you know, this idea of having roots but having wings? I think that there is something. I mean, we're sort of one. I mean, I'm. Oddly, I'm also split because I'm my, I'm half from the Faroe Islands and half from Iceland. Yeah, so my mum's from Iceland, and I think I've got such a yeah, sort of very, very much a sort of nostalgic connection to that. And I think even though I spent most of my time growing up in Denmark, I was always sort of slightly conscious of being. I mean, I, I mean, as much as you can be, I was a kid there, and, and it was often, you know, I have a very rare name and people could never pronounce it. No one can pronounce it there either. And, and so I was always, that was always a big part of me. And I think that's, if you grow up as a sort of immigrant in a place where develop maybe more nostalgic connections to it. And I have, but I've got these incredibly fond memories of being a child in the north of Iceland. Absolutely fantastic book. It, it got a lot of, it's written by a girl uh, from Adelaide, had a kid called Burial Rights. And I would, That'd be my book recommendation for, for this podcast. And I kept somehow, I don't know how, ended up on sort of high school exchange in a place called Söder Krokur. Söder Krokur is not the center of the universe. It is a tiny, tiny little small town on the north north coast of Iceland, which is the next town over from where I spent all my summers. I was in a place called Blendos. And she wrote this book about the, the the last woman to be I'm not going to give it away no 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 read, just read the book so it's, it's about uh, there's a folklore in, in the story it's, it's an extraordinary read but it's set in this sort of in northern Iceland it was a tough time to be, a, be alive in Iceland but I I remember reading it and I remember being able to smell I could smell the grass and so these really amazing descriptions by this you know, Adelaidean that I just I had this visceral connection to it. And I just that's not never never gone away for me. And I, for me, I would hope. I mean, and, and I, it's incredibly difficult. And it's something that I'm trying, but failing miserably. At, is is to to you know pass some of that on, on to, to my children. I think we have this. There, there's we, even we've got these big family trees like we like we got I've got an app I can see anyone from Iceland I can see people back to the year 700 that I'm I'm related to and, and my son had a sort of genealogy project thrown at him at school and I was like yeah boy we're gonna win at this I was like drawing it out we went to office works and it's like and he of course like 10 minutes in was completely bored with me and I just kept going yeah so I would love for them to have that connection I mean it's we were also, I mean, my wife, she speaks Danish. She's quite good at Danish, but we've sort of, our relationship started in English. So we speak mainly English. I grew up speaking three languages at home, none of them English. So there is there is definitely something that I'm very conscious of that I'm, I'm not able to pass all of that on to my kids. I would love to. We've got to force them to move to Iceland. <laughs> i got to say, like, yeah. Iceland is, is literally the top of my travel bucket list i don't think i've mm. ever seen a bad photo from iceland i just don't think it's no. actually defies the laws of the universe to have a bad photo from iceland so it's very much top, top, top of my list i mean I, I grew up as a child thinking you know northern lights was just how people lived and you know i've got you know, sitting out in the snow and in, in one of the hot like we have got these because we have access to you know hot water comes from the ground and you sit everyone has one in the backyard you just sit there and there's one snow up over your ears and you just sit there and watch the aurora I just thought that was how people lived. Wow. Yeah. One image. And here we are in Australia with all of our... Yeah. There are pretty good things here too. We just... There, I mean, not, not yeah, the northern lights in a, in a thermal pool in winter. Yeah. Time. Yeah. But I wish to say, actually, with my... I mean, I've been... I mean, I've dragged my kids through some, some pretty hairy situations myself. So, you know, we, we went and lived in Vietnam. That was... I thought that would be, be an enriching thing for, for them to do. And, and maybe it was. <laughs> yeah. And there's a whole story. Once again, if you haven't listened to that episode of Departure Lounge, you know you, you've got you've got a, a, a cracking story of drama uh, about Vietnam, probably probably more than one. But you did tell a story of like dashing through traffic with your son. I think it was on on the handlebars of the boat, motorbike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have lasting memories of that? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't the handlebars. I'm not completely crazy. I mean, it was on the little thing that you stand on, but he was sort of standing. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great, and and just I mean, that's I think you know, people live. That's how people live. It's easy to sit, sort of sit back here and, and, and come to your offices and think, "Oh, that's that's a completely crazy thing. I'd never do that." But that's how how people. That's how you get around. You can't really do it any other way. And I have really fond memories. He was really into Katy Perry at the time. You know how kids can obsess, and particularly with their, their fireworks song. And 
he would put his little helmet on. I would put him on, on the front of the bike. And every full moon, basically, it floods in District 2 in, in Saigon. And so it's all really quite hairy getting through the motorbikes. And sometimes you just got bang through. And he was just singing like, you know, fire work and going through the thing and just living his best little life. I just thought that's that's pretty cool that we got to do this. Those memories yeah. for forever, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun times. Mate, it's been awesome chatting. I really enjoyed being able to sort of dive into some of these other stories. It's been a real privilege for me. So thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks, Rob. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.